Well, good afternoon. Um, before the coffee break, I was rather intrigued to discover that Flemings were actually rather good dike builders, <laughs> although not in a good way, unfortunately, yeah. by the sound of it. Well, in recent years, I've, not, I've become not so much a dike worker, but a, a, but, but a paleohodologist. In plain English, that means I've been thinking about early long-distance routeways. like the monks trod, as, as you've seen here, <coughs> as you see here. By, by using documentary sources, place names and archaeological evidence, in the country we now call England, it's possible to argue for the existence of quite a few old routeways in roughly the middle of the first millennium AD. However, many of them are probably a fair bit older than that. There's a good deal of cultural entropy, I believe, in ways of moving, in, in, in moving from place to place, as Richard Mortimer, I think, demonstrated very ably earlier on this afternoon. Over time, of course, people's travel priorities will change and new routes will be created. However, stretches of the old cross-country routes, the best ones, established centuries and millennia ago, will endure and survive in some form. Some scholars maintain that even Roman military roads may be following older lines of communication. And it was interesting at Sharpstone Hill, just outside Shrewsbury, to discover a putative Roman road turning into an Iron Age road. Old long-distance routeways have in some sense belonged to everyone, and in such circumstances we might reasonably expect to find that continuity is a dominant historical motif. However, this is difficult territory for archaeologists because we're not supposed to date things any earlier than we can demonstrate by the evidence, are we? It's also the case that archaeologists don't much like dealing with routeways. By the way, it's a good convention to call them routeways before the advent of riding. The riding and roads are etymologically closely related. Usually, we don't know how old they are beyond a minimum age. Some of those who wrote about historic landscapes a century ago made rather wild claims for the antiquity of routeways such as the, such as the Ridgeway and the Icknield Way. And Chris Taylor, whose, whose Roads and Tracks of Britain is still the best guide to this subject, <coughs> felt it necessary to, to apply a strong dose of scepticism. Another thing is that since many old routeways are still in use, they're not generally listed as sites and monuments. Most people regard a long-established right-of-way as an amenity, not an archaeological site. And there's a third conundrum. If you want to date the origins, or at least the early life, of um, a routeway, using the evidence of well-stratified finds, or material for radiocarbon dating, where exactly would you dig? Well, it seems to me that we shouldn't be too intimidated by this dating issue, which isn't, after all, confined to early routeways. Tom Williamson, writing about patterns of coaxial land boundaries in contemporary landscapes. Sorry, that's almost invisible, but I'm sure some, a lot of you know Tom's work. Tom has argued that, in one sense, they have no date at all. They developed organically and represent many centuries of development involving phases of expansion and abandonment, infilling and alteration, all structured by the extensive use of the landscape within particular topographic frameworks. There seems to be little doubt, he, he goes on, that the majority of their principal elements were fixed in the course of the early and middle Saxon period, however much they owed to earlier centuries. Well, Tom's hedging his bets a bit, but it's an interesting perception, I think. <coughs> Old routeways have the same sort of properties as coaxial landscapes in terms of their entropy and their long-term dormancy. They may go into sleep mode and be uh, reawakened. And that's what I mean by the Cheshire Cat Syndrome. And it's a syndrome which occurs with prehistoric ceremonial landscapes. And here, it can be demonstrated archaeologically. These places have various phases of use and so on and so forth. There's a whole uh, miniature history associated with, with cemeteries like this. But we shouldn't obsess about dating. Understanding something better is just as important as dating it. And they may be the two things are in any case related. As Sir Mortimer Wheeler said a long time ago, we have the timetable, now let us have some trains. <laughs>
And if we're to understand old long distance routeways in context, we'll need the perspective of landscape archaeology, the facility of thinking at different geolog ge geographical scales, the terrain of argument, as well as direct evidence. The good news is that by definition, old long distance routeways have both the time depth and the sheer length to get involved with many other archaeological features, as well as acquiring significant place names. Of course, that's if you believe in them. W. G. Hoskins didn't. He wrote about the lanes of southwestern England, handmade a thousand years ago, still wandering from hamlet to farm and from farm to farm. And he believed that the road network in Anglo-Saxon times was simply an inter-village system, if you could call it that. But he couldn't have been more wrong. Devon's actually a very good county for identifying old long-distance routeways, especially those running along watersheds. Post-Roman, early medieval England saw the increasing amalgamation of smaller polities and <coughs> the eventual emergence of the English state. It's pretty well impossible to think of the organised warfare and political manoeuvres involved, not to mention elite horse riding, without a network of long-distance routeways, including, of course, the legacy of Roman imperial roads. Herefordshire, the county with which I'm concerned this afternoon, <coughs> takes its name from Hereford, the army ford, a name which was in being by around AD 700. By examining various historical and geographical contexts, I believe, we may be able to bring old long distance roofways into sharper focus. One such context would be the role of roads at the interface between major polities and perhaps peoples of different linguistic or ethnic affiliation, whether they intermingle freely <coughs> or, are, or are kept more separate by a relatively hard boundary. I've never forgotten an incident which occurred a few years ago when I was walking with some archaeological friends in the extreme west of Devon. We paused for a moment looking over the Tamar Valley there's a fine view of Cornwall from here, I said. One of the locals was passing by, walking his dog. There's no such thing, he said. The River Tamar happens to have functioned effectively as an enduring long-term boundary. It could readily figure on mental maps, and it could also provide a barrier at which military forces could be confronted and held up. When crossed in force, it must have acted as the local Rubicon. But natural frontiers don't always correspond to changing geopolitical realities. Ruling elites are prone to override them, literally. Ever since the later Bronze Age, people have attempted to improve on nature by constructing linear earthworks. And um, this is one of the ones, that, this is one in Swaledale, which I overconfidently dated to the early post-Roman period, only to find that uh, more observant and close field workers uh, contradicted me and put it back into the late prehistoric period. Shows the kind of thing that can happen. To us, these linear earthworks look static and inscrutable. If we're to understand them in context, they clearly need to be visualized primarily in terms of human movement, and thus routeways, whether or not they were intended as boundaries. This is an important distinction. In her excellent account of the East Yorkshire Iron Age, Melanie Giles has argued that many linear earthworks, which are often incomprehensible in terms of boundary patterns, are probably related to livestock movements in a competitive herding environment. And I would recommend you to uh, read her, her book if, if you haven't done so. <coughs> The construction of linear earthworks wouldn't necessarily introduce a more settled state of affairs. Indeed, constructing them might represent an act of provocation. In an early medieval context, we have to think about contemporary routeways in terms of both attack and defence. <coughs> Which routes were, were war bands likely to use when they were on the offensive? Where, where could the enemy be advantageously confronted? How could a military strategist get an early warning of where the enemy was concentrating his forces? 
How could he most efficiently assemble his own? Which sections of a given routeway were most dangerous in terms of vulnerability to ambush or of slowing down one's progress? Speed was often of the essence. Simply by rehearsing a few of these questions, one can see a need for messengers, ideally on horseback, their mounts properly looked after and speedily available, using what I call horseworthy routes. I don't suppose Napoleon's a very good example, but uh, <laughs> I quite fancy this slide all the same. Corsica, actually. One can also see the need for keep keeping watch from specific lookout points. Doubtless spies were part of the picture. In the early Middle Ages, as in Roman Britain, routeways constituted a live network, a network of information, and also the basic framework for the mental maps of the elite, who needed to be both in control of geopolitical information and also well-placed, literally, to take effective action. <coughs> Failing to find good answers to these questions might um, affect the positions of one's head on one's shoulders, literally. All this means that, in terms of routeways, people need to be able to move to and along the frontier, or frontier zone, as well as behind it. I've recently been doing work on old long-distance routes in Herefordshire, where I now live, and thinking about their relationship to Office Dyke. Herefordshire provides some, something of a conundrum. Here the dike, as it travels south, veers to the southeast and apparently becomes hyphenated, with well-preserved stretches seemingly alternating with gaps. It reaches the River Wyatt Bridge Solvers, west of Hereford, and then goes missing altogether until Redbrook, just south of Monmouth, before resuming a course which takes us along the western edge of the Forest of Dean. So it's another version of the Cheshire Cat Syndrome, if you like. Various explanations have been offered for both the apparent hyphenation and for the dyke's absence in South Herefordshire. In their excellent book on the dyke, Keith Ray and Ian Bapti have suggested that there, are, that there are preservation issues in the hyphenated zone and that intensive fieldwork might well narrow or close the gaps, although they also raise the possibility that the dyke wasn't fully completed along this line. They also suggest that the dyke may have linked together a number of disparate sections of pre-existing cross-valley and cross-ridge dikes in a contested frontier zone which was demarcated and defended in a piecemeal ad hoc fashion. Sorry, that was Sorry that's so badly scanned. As, as for the absence of the dike in South Herefordshire, the frontier line may have been continued by the River Wye, which here runs through the old polity of Erging, alias the land of the Dunsetai. Erging, once a sizable and independent British polity, had been partly colonised by English settlers and was in the process of becoming a mercy dependency, poised to provide the protective shock troops for the advance of Mercian armies against the British of Brickeniog and beyond. Ray and Bapti also suggest that an episode of Welsh aggression in the 8th century may have forced a retrenchment perhaps accounting for the southeastward shift in the course of the dyke. From Ray and Baptist's perspective, the behaviour of Offa's dyke in Herefordshire reflects a frontier zone in flux. It may have represented both a retrenchment in response to recent Welsh military successes and an aspiration to restore a boundary along the eastern fringes of the Black Mountains, beyond the western edge of Erging. And as anyone who's walked the Offa's dyke footpath will know, this is what the English did achieve in due course. My fieldwork's at an early stage and I really don't want to weary you with local detail. I'll just pick out a couple of long distance roads or routeways um, which are of interest in terms of east-west movement um, within the frontier zone. They both pass through well-preserved stretches of office dyke in, the, in this particular zone. One is the former Roman road when running west from the small Roman town of Magnus, now Kenchester. Um, whoops, no, that's wrong. Sorry, I'll have to do this one without slides, I'm afraid, this particular one. Uh, but there's a Roman road which, which runs west from Kenchester, 
Um, further east, this road met two Roman roads running roughly north-south, each largely perpetuated by the lines of roads in use to this day. These would have facilitated movements of war bands and armies behind and along the frontier zone. Putting the stretch of dike which guards the road to the west along the Wye Corridor at Bridge Sollers, um, some way west of Kenchester, would also have shielded the river crossing made by another Roman road which headed southwest towards the edge of the Black Mountains. Further north, there's a rather obvious old routeway which is monitored by the stretch of well preserved dike at Lions Hall. Um, that's. Uh, Yeah, that's it. Uh, this stretch here, um, coming through, yeah, that, that, this, is, this is the old road, coming through here like this, and uh, that's Lions Hall. And in Lions Hall, um, the relative age of this road is demonstrated by the road pattern in the village, where, where drivers along the well-used A48 road, A480 road, have to take a couple of right angle bends in order to cross it. Going east, this road intersects with the north-south Roman road at Mortimer's Cross and carries on into the Team Valley. It's heading in, in the direction of the heart of Mercia. Going west, it takes a high ridge route over Cairo Hill and then probably forks, with one continuation <coughs> along the Beagun's Ridge and another down through Payne Castle, where it runs through the old Welsh policy of Elvile. Some of its route follows the current Indian Wales boundary. This is a good area for lookout posts. There are places like Disgulva and Toot Hill, and also for messengers, the Doomsday Book record for Lions Hall itself mentions three rad men, riding men, who did riding services for their lords. And halfway between these two routeways on the line of the dike is the place named Sarnsfield, as uh, Keith and Ian have pointed out, which is based on the old Welsh name Sarn for road, and that's right across the, uh, the main road between Leamster and, uh, and Clyro, effectively. It's also possible to pick up a transverse route. Uh, again, I'm sorry about the uh, about these uh, slides, but basically there's a there's a long road running up here, the Kevin Road, which is the old Kevin Forth, which is the Welsh for highway. It's, it's continued by a footpath here, going down, <coughs> and, and, go, and then it goes through a, a significant place name here. Bulk carries on there, runs uh, runs across here this way. And then crosses the Y, um, comes through here like this, and crosses the Y at, uh, sorry, comes up like this, crosses the Y at Clifford, where it can easily get onto the road that goes over Cairo Hill, and so on. Anyway, that's just local detail. My fieldwork is at an early stage. I've come across a, an interesting and inevitable paleohydrological phenomenon. The older the road, the more likely it is that sections of it will go out of use or get repositioned, making it harder to make the case in the simplest archaeological terms and thus encouraging the scepticism of those who are that way inclined. I can only say by way of riposte that often not joining the dots often leads to a less credible situation on the ground. Ray and Bapti are probably right to argue that Office Dyke in North Herefordshire is less of a Cheshire cat than it appears to be. Back in the day, probably the dike was more continuous. But be that as it may, what I want to argue here is that Offa's dike, and indeed other linear earthworks, are incomprehensible without a proper understanding of old established routeways. I believe that we should push our understanding of this relationship further. As Ray and Bapti have so capably demonstrated, if we're to gain a greater understanding of how linear earthworks operated in the landscape and in contemporary strategic calculations, we need to operate at several scales of perception. The study of those other linear features, earlier routeways, may well be one of the more important of such scales. Thank you.